tonight at 10, after months of travel restrictions, many families and friends have finally been reunited today. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> From now on, people fully vaccinated in the US or in most of the EU no longer have to self-isolate. I really didn't think it was possible to come home until I actually set foot off the plane. I didn't think I was going to, you know, I just, I didn't think it was going to happen. Today, the NHS COVID app in England and Wales was tweaked so that fewer contacts will be told to self-isolate. We'll have more on that and the change in rules for entry to the UK, which happened in the early hours of this morning. Also tonight, the Olympic sprinter from Belarus, who took refuge at the Polish embassy in Tokyo, has now been granted a humanitarian visa. Now bring it home for us, Oliver. Yes! At the Games, the first gold medal in team eventing for Great Britain since 1972. Wow. And a very special welcome for Team GB swimmers. They return home after their most successful games ever. And coming up in the sport on the BBC News Channel. History made as Emily Campbell becomes the first British woman to win an Olympic medal in weightlifting. Good evening. After months of being separated by the COVID restrictions on international travel, many families and friends have finally been able to meet and embrace today after the rules for entry to the UK changed in the early hours of this morning. The change means that people who've been fully vaccinated in the United States or in the European Union no longer have to quarantine for 10 days if they arrive from a country on the amber list. But it's important to remember that stricter rules still apply for those travelling from France. People still have to take a COVID test before setting off for the UK and then a PCR test within two days of arrival. There were fears in some quarters of a so-called amber watch list, identifying those countries at risk of being moved to a stricter list. But those plans have now been abandoned by the UK government. Many Conservative MPs, some travel industry leaders, had been warning that it could cause even more damage. Our transport correspondent, Caroline Davis, has the latest. Through the dark and the difficulty of the last few months, they've waited for this. As soon as we got off the airplane, we got so excited. Um, yeah. You know, even the little ones were shouting, London, London. Well, we've only just literally walked in a few minutes ago, but... <laughs> When we get home and see everybody, yeah, it will sink in. Granny, granny? That's the granny. As soon as the quarantine rules changed last week, Naomi booked her flights from California to see her parents, taking a message from her children. We love you, Mom. We love I you. really miss you. Guys. Bye. On one of the first flights to land in the UK since the rules changed, <laughs> while her parents so. wait nervously. I couldn't sleep. I, I think I saw every hour. <laughs> I think I did get sleep in between, but it was just, yeah, I'm too excited. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> They've not seen each other since December 2019. I really didn't think it was possible to come home until I actually <laughs> set foot off the plane. Oh, my God. I've left my husband and two kids at home, and it pains me to have left them behind, but grateful that they gave me the opportunity to come. It's all very emotional. Love you, Dad. Love you. Love you, mate. There are a lot of excited and, quite frankly, relieved reunions at the airport today. But for many people who have loved ones not in the US or in Europe, there's still some disappointment that they're not included. Gopi Krishnan hasn't seen his 13-year-old daughter in the UK since last October. He's double-jabbed, but with a vaccine the UK hasn't approved, and lives in the UAE, which is currently on the UK's red list. We were given this vaccine at, at that time, and there was no choice at all. So you take what was given to you. So yes, it's, it's, it's unfair. It's just pretty stressful, to be honest. So I'm just uh, wondering if there is any way to, you know, that I can meet in the next six months, nine months, or a year. The travel industry want the government to go further. We'd like to see uh, other amber countries opened up for people who've been doubly vaccinated. We'd also like to see the cost of testing brought down. A simple way to do that would be to replace the PCR test that everyone has to take post-arrival with a simpler lamp or lateral flow test, which is much cheaper. 
The list of countries that are rated green, amber and red is due to be updated this week. This evening, in a move welcomed by the travel industry, government sources confirmed that the idea of an amber watch list containing countries that were considered to be at risk of turning from amber to red had been scrapped. Earlier, the Prime Minister said travel rules must be clear and manage the risk to public health. We've had to balance it because of the anxiety that I think a lot of people have, I have, about uh, importing new variants, bringing back the disease. But we also have to recognise that people want uh, badly to go on their summer holidays. We need to get people geek get the travel industry moving again, we need to get our city centres uh, open again, and so we want an approach that is as, as simple as, as we can possibly make. There are still many families waiting to meet again around the world, but for some, today, for the first time in a long time, they felt in arm's reach. Caroline Davis, BBC News. Let's have a look then at the latest official data. The number of new coronavirus cases has fallen slightly. The latest government uh, figures show that there were 21,952 new cases in the latest 24-hour period. Uh, last Monday, there were almost 25,000. Uh, there have been an average of 26,364 new cases per day in the past seven days. 24 deaths were recorded in the last 24 hours. That's an average of 76 deaths a day in the past week. number of people in hospital with COVID has levelled off at just under 6,000. More than 88% of UK adults have now had their first jab and nearly 73% are now fully vaccinated. And, uh, with me in the studio is our health correspondent, Jim Reid. Jim, can we talk first of all about reliability of statistics um, and given the, the latest ones we've had, which obviously have piqued interest, um, what should we read into them? So more encouraging news really, Hugh, about the direction of this pandemic. You might remember a couple of weeks ago, July 19th, there was quite a significant relaxation of the rules, the lockdown rules in England, so-called Freedom Day. It included things like allowing nightclubs to reopen again. In some other countries, that kind of action led to quite a sharp spike in the infection rate. Well, in England, two weeks on, we're not seeing it here, as you just said in those, with those daily figures. Actually, a reduction in infections compared with last week. One scientist I spoke to early on, earlier on said, look, if we were going to see a problem linked to that reopening, we would be begin to see it now. Now, the fact we're not is quite important. We're also seeing hospital admissions plateau, and in some, some cases, a, a sign they're starting to fall in England. So, you know, still quite early to say. Behaviour can change, but at the moment, all the data is pointing in, in quite a positive direction. The other thing I wanted to ask was about the COVID app in England and Wales, the fact that it's being tweaked to make it, what, less sensitive. Um, what do we make of that? So this change actually affects a very specific group of users. So it's not everyone. It's those people who test positive and then go on to say they don't have any symptoms. So no fever, no cough, that kind of thing, for example. It's quite a technical change. It cuts the number of days. The app then calculates that person might be infectious. The government says, as a result, far fewer people, far fewer of their contacts might have to go away and self-isolate. It does, though, just apply to England and Wales. There's a different app for Northern Ireland and Scotland. Jim, many thanks once again. Uh, Jim Reid there, our health correspondent. Now, news from the uh, Olympics, uh, but really not from the competitive side this time, because Kristina Tsimanouskaya, 24-year-old sprinter from Belarus, has refused to fly home early from the Olympics in Japan, uh, and she's now been granted a humanitarian visa by Poland. Uh, she had sought refuge in the Polish embassy in Tokyo after reports that she'd been ordered to return home. Her apparent offence uh, was criticising her coaches on social media after they'd entered her for a race that she'd not been expecting to compete in. Our correspondent Rupert Wingfield Hayes has the story. This was the moment earlier this evening when Kristina Timonovskaya stepped onto Polish soil. Safe from the Belarusian officials, she says were forcing her to leave Tokyo against her will. Miss Timonovskaya was spotted at Tokyo's Haneda airport, about to board a flight to Istanbul. But it's very clear she didn't want to go. For me, it will be really dangerous to go to the stadium. The Belarusian team says that claim is nonsense, that she was being sent home because of her emotional and psychological state. But the Polish government has decided to believe her story and to offer refuge. 
What's going on here in Tokyo has very much the whiff of history about it, because back in the days of the Cold War, Olympic defections were a regular event. The last one I can find was in Los Angeles in 1984. Now we have someone defecting from Belarus, a country that's been described as the last dictatorship in Europe. And she's going to Poland, a country that was once part of the Soviet bloc and is now very much the opposite. Last year, Belarus was rocked by huge protests demanding an end to the 27-year rule of Alexander Lukashenko. Poland was a vocal supporter of these protests, and it's clear today's offer of refuge to Ms. Timonovskaya fits in with Warsaw's support for the opposition. Every person who cannot return to Belarus for political reasons and wants to come to Poland can count on our support, the Deputy Foreign Minister says. Ms. Timnovskaya is under the care of the Polish state. She wants to come to Poland. We will grant her all support. Back in Japan, there is relief this drama has been resolved so quickly. But with six more days till the Olympics close, Tokyo must be a little worried that other athletes could be tempted to follow Ms. Timonovskaya's lead. Rupert Wingfield Hayes, BBC News, in Tokyo. Now, Team GB have won their 11th gold medal of the Games, with victory in the team eventing at the Tokyo Equestrian Centre. Uh, all three British riders were making their Olympic debut, uh, and it's the first British team victory in eventing uh, since 1972. Our sports correspondent, Natalie Perks, has more details. For decades, Britain has been the team eventing bridesmaid with a succession of silver and bronze. In Tokyo, they finally struck gold. It's the most comprehensive test of horse and rider. Good positioning. These equine triathletes demonstrated finesse in the dressage. Picture perfect so far. Proved their endurance in the cross country. And through the finish he comes. And with a commanding lead built, we're now looking to be faultless in the show jumping. I just want to jump. Tom McEwen with a clear round to get the party started. Not a foot wrong. Eight years ago, Laura Collett suffered an horrific fall and was in an induced coma, losing sight in one eye. She was giving it everything to become the Olympic champion here. And with only one fence down, it left the best event rider in the world, Oliver Townend, with the job... Now bring it home for us, Oliver. ...of just getting round without drama. Yes! 49 years! Great Britain have waited for their eventing gold medal. Unreal. Um, it's still not sunk, sunk in, but there'll be um, a big celebration and I don't think he'll be with a cup of tea and a biscuit. <laughs> That's it then. A gold for Great Britain, the first time in this event since 1972. But there's no rest for these riders. They've got to go again in the individual event now and there could be more medals. Eventing was originally a cavalry test for officers' charges with military precision. Tom McEwen and horse Toledo de Cursa jumped all obstacles to perfection. If Oliver Townend. Only two riders could now deny him gold. One was his teammate. But Oliver Townend's individual hopes were dashed by fence two. Oh. A majestic final round from Yulia Krajewski of Germany saw her become the first woman to ever win eventing individual gold. But McEwen Silver capped an eventful night for Britain. Yeah, I think it's the same with all of us. Sort of, we put in many, many hours from children to where we are now, and actually it's all paying off, uh, all the work we put in. Gold and silver tonight, then that's four medals already for Britain's riders. How's that for horsepower? Natalie Perks, BBC News, Tokyo. And history has been made at the Games as 43-year-old Laurel Hubbard, who was born biologically male and came out as a trans woman in her 30s, represented New Zealand in the women's super heavyweight weightlifting competition. Hubbard's participation is viewed by some as a landmark moment for inclusivity, but others argue that she has an unfair physical advantage, as our sports editor Dan Rowan explains. It was an appearance that made Olympic history. Laurel Hubbard today becoming the first openly transgender athlete at the Games to compete in a different gender category to that which they were born. Having lived as a man for more than three decades and been a promising junior weightlifter, the New Zealander transitioned eight years ago. Her selection for Tokyo was hugely controversial, but she also had backing. When a person is selected into the team, from our point of view, our culture and our team culture is very much about respecting, about you know, making sure that people are treated well, that they are safe, 
and that they're able to perform to the very best of their ability. But Hubbard's much-anticipated appearance was short-lived. That's a shame, a disappointing opening attempt. Failing to record a successful lift in the women's super heavyweight category. I think I was just overwhelmed by the excitement of being on the Olympic platform. It's such a truly special place. I think I might have just uh, overcooked it slightly tonight. I'm not sure it's possible for any person to really block out everything that's happening in the world. Um, but uh, you just do what you can and get on with it. Laurel Hubbard may not have won a medal here today, but this was still a major milestone for trans athletes. And regardless of her performance, she will remain at the very centre of one of the most divisive issues in sport, one that is forcing it to confront the tension between inclusivity and fairness. Hubbard qualified after the IOC changed its rules to allow women to compete if their testosterone levels were below a certain threshold. But critics claim that's unfair and say today sets a precedent that could harm women's sport. I'm not seeking to demonise Hubbard. She is there within the rules. However, the science available now shows that male-born athletes, despite transition treatment, retain significant amounts of the male physical advantage which male puberty gives you. The science is fiercely debated, however, and one of those who helped shape the IOC's current transgender policy believes the threat to women's sport has been overstated. Trans people are only one-sixth as likely as cisgender people to go out for organized sports. The idea that this very repressed minority of, of less than 1% is going to take over women's sports is, is ludicrous. Meanwhile, as the competition continued without Hubbard in Tokyo, Emily Campbell became the first female weightlifter to win an Olympic medal for Britain, lifting a total of 283 kilograms to claim silver. I'm just very grateful and I'm very thankful right now, you know. I just wanted to prove to everybody that, you know, if you work hard and, you know, you, you work hard for what you want, that you can achieve it. And I hope every little boy and girl is watching me today and wants to, you know, go out and achieve their dreams. Emily Campbell! Rarely has weightlifting received such attention. This a historic day for the sport in more ways than one. Dan Rowan, BBC News, Tokyo. So let's have a look at the medal table after 10 days of competition in Tokyo. Uh, China atop with 29 gold medals. Uh, the US is second with Japan, the host nation, third. Team GB are currently in sixth place with 11 gold medals, 12 silver, 12 bronze, making that a total of 35 medals so far. Move on to some of the day's other news. South Wales police have named a five-year-old boy found dead in the river Ogmore on Saturday as Logan Mwangi from Bridgend. Uh, he was also known as Logan Williamson. A man and a woman in their 30s and a 13-year-old boy are being questioned on suspicion of murder. The police said they were not looking for anyone else in relation to the incident. The latest research from the University of Glasgow on the risks of football players developing dementia has found that those who play in defence and tend to head the ball most often are five times more likely than the general population to develop a neurodegenerative disease. Leading scientists say that football should carry health warnings when they're sold, as our health editor Hugh Pym tells us. How safe is heading? Questions and concerns are growing. A new study funded by the football authorities in England has highlighted risks linked to head injuries. The research team was led by Professor Willie Stewart, a brain expert, interviewed in a BBC documentary by Alan Shearer. Three recent cases um, of uh, dementia. He argues that the game has to change. Football has to consider, um, can the game of football be played without head impacts, without heading? Um, even at some level, you know, maybe at amateur and, and, and youth level, can we think of a game without heading? He even argues that footballs on sale should carry a health warning about the risks of repeated heading. So what are the main findings of the research? Well, the study suggests that former professional footballers have a three and a half times greater risk of developing brain disorders like dementia than the population as a whole. For defenders, who tend to head the ball most often, it's a five times greater risk. But for goalkeepers who rarely head the ball, the risk is broadly similar to the general population. Astle nodding it on, but... Jeff Astle, who played for West Brom in England, died nearly 20 years ago. A coroner ruled he had a brain condition linked to heading. 
His daughter Dawn has campaigned for greater recognition of the dangers and she welcomed the new study. Football, you know, to millions and, peop millions and millions of people around the world, in including me, is a much loved sport. But for my dad and for all these other professionals, it was just their job and they should be afforded the same protection from known risks as anybody else in any other job. And it's over the the Football Association said new guidelines limiting heading in training in England would take effect soon. Heading for youth teams has already been restricted in each of the UK's nations. But the new report may well fuel demands for further action. Now, as Parliament at Westminster starts its summer break, it's a chance for MPs of all parties to take a look at and for the Conservatives who focus so much on their gains in the north of England, parts of the Midlands, uh, there are questions about the impact that that's had on their traditional strongholds in the south. And with big policy decisions looming as the government looks beyond the pandemic, our correspondent Alex Forsyth considers whether the Conservative Party can keep its promise to deliver an economic recovery that works for all. The landscape may be green, but politically, this area is mostly blue. Surrey is the heart of the home county's traditional Tory turf, though some have turned away from the party. Like Conservative Liz, who is the leader of the she had wanted to stay in the Middle East, but said she would accept Brexit, just not the way Boris Johnson handled it. I appreciated the fact that he had to get Brexit done. The way he went about it, the proroguing of Parliament, and I think he just sledgehammered it through at all costs. Brexit caused ripples across the political system, creating new dividing lines and shifting allegiances. This former Chancellor, who was once ousted from his party for his views on Brexit, says the government's approach would have attracted some but alienated others. Once a Surrey MP, it is part of a wider challenge for Tories in the South. When you couple that with some of the issues that there are around planning reforms, um, the narrative of the government around supporting the, North, the levelling up agenda, which is making some people in the South quite nervous about what that means for them, I do think there's a confluence of issues Hello, here which could be quite dangerous now. for the party. It needs to tread carefully. Boris Johnson's party has had undeniable success at the ballot box, but there have been some losses in local elections here and a by-election in Buckinghamshire. Some do blame the changes expected for planning and development rules. For others, there are nerves about the political focus on the Midlands and North, even though Boris Johnson's recently promised the South won't miss out. At this farmer's market in Guildford, though, that didn't seem an issue. Well, I've been Conservative for a long time and I think they've done a wonderful job, actually. There has been a big north-south divide and I think if we can even that up a bit, it's all for the good. With the economy opening after the hit of the pandemic, the government has promised to help the whole country recover. Paul, an events organiser who recently joined the Tories, thinks nerves about support in the South are overblown. He's confident about the party's future. I actually support Boris as a character and we need someone who is prepared to get on with it, make decisions, not worry too much about upsetting the odd person, but stick to their guns. Yes, they people might vote for other parties in local elections, but when it comes to national election time, they will vote with the party that they're with, which I, I don't think it will affect the Conservative majority to any great extent. It's too early to say whether there's meaningful shift in this political landscape. But Julie, once a Surrey County councillor who lost her seat at elections in May, has already felt the consequences. She blames local development plans, but has a wider warning for her party. You have to balance across the piece for everybody and not be complacent and take your core vulture for granted, which you think is what people are feeling down here. The Tory pitch to the public has so far proved a recipe for electoral success. With big policy choices looming after the summer, the message from some here is simply tread carefully. Alex Forsyth, BBC News, Surrey. Before we go, a little more on the Olympics. Team GB's swimming squad have returned home after their most successful games ever. They brought back a record haul of eight medals and were reunited with their families at Heathrow Airport this evening. Uh, Ellen Roper was there too. 
This is the most successful swimming team in British Olympic history. Today, returning to London Heathrow, their bags a little heavier than when they left. Adam Peaty reunited with his son George as he looks to take a well-earned break from the pool. Probably three months, three months at least, uh, which is a very, very long time in terms of sport and, and swimming, especially because you, you lose a feel for the water after like three days. So sport is one of those ones where it's a 365, 24-7. So the amount of pressure firstly, but also the amount of just the kind of the self-talk. Um, you know, if you do one thing wrong, is that going to affect your whole day? So the mental kind of well-being is more important than ever. Adam Peaty is the double Olympic champion. Fantastic swim. Belief, that's what Peaty credits for this British brilliance in the pool. Their eight medals a long way from the disappointment of London 2012. The home games saw the team miss its medal target, its funding then slashed. Tom Dean wasn't around for that though. Tokyo his first games and he leaves with two gold medals around his neck. It's amazing to have to see them all here finally, you know, be able to hug everyone and, and it was so tough not having them there. I mean, when I was on the podium, I got really emotional because I couldn't look up into the crowd and see my mum like I normally do. So having this homecoming is just so, so special. Elsewhere, and Duncan Scott became the first Briton to win four medals at one Olympics. There were golds for the mixed medley relay and the men's freestyle relay. With the stresses of travel and quarantine now behind them, they're all off for a well earned rest. Or, from what we've seen of Tom Dean's family, probably a big party. Eleanor Roper, BBC News. It's a very fitting welcome home to them. That's it. Now on BBC One, uh, time for the news where you are. Have a good night.